And I, I just think, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to even think of how to frame this question for you. And I apologize. It's just, it's just a feeling of there's just this acknowledgement that I have to just, it's like I'm being humbled before this thing that I am completely without, I, I, am, I have no control over this situation. I don't know how to proceed with it, but I feel something like really profound and powerful happening too that I would like to pursue, but I can't. And, um, and I just been thinking about how love is, it's like you were describing like coming out on stage and you know that like this, there's this sort of bittersweetness that comes with this experience of this is a very limited experience that I'm going to have. And I have to really feel it as presently as possible. Um, yeah. knowing that it will end at some point. And that's just like life. That's the whole experience of your life is that way too. And I feel like love is that way too. Like something about the acknowledgement that the people you love will die and that you too will die and that your death will affect those that you love will, that, that all is, is mixed in with the whole experience. And I think the pandemic in particular has highlighted these things for me. And I just wanted to talk to you about, about love. <laughs> um, and I don't know, how, how has this, uh, maybe uh, your experiences as of late, has it at all affected or impacted the way that you've experienced love or you share your love with others? Um, yeah, that, that's really my question, I guess. Okay, well, it's of course, it's a personal question, but uh, sure. virtually every question I've been asked the last 15 years is a personal question, although it's rarely about me. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's about what I care about, and that's more personal than asking me about me. So, well, you've, you've touched on a subject that's very current because uh, the book I'm working on is a book about matrimony. Mm -hmm. And so love, as you might imagine, figures in the in the proceedings here's what i learned such as it is about love when i was in the death trade i mean first of all i didn't meet people at when they were at their best obviously not i didn't meet people when they're at their most illusioned either i met them when they're trying to figure out how to be disillusioned because that's what a terminal diagnosis will do, possibly. It'll disillusion you. And if you think about what the word actually means, you should be looking for disillusionment most of your waking hours. Right? To be freed of the illusion that will never come to pass kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's what finding out that you're dying can be. It could be the end of your bullshit, the end of your 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 make work project, you know, the end of killing time, the end of so many things. Uh, and it, and it, and if you're lucky and you do your work, it ends just about everything you thought was true, man, what's left. Well, there's the big question. And the answer is this time that's left to you is for something. It's not just the kind of withering denouement. It's for something. It's a particular kind of time. Mm. You've had other particular kinds of time, like adolescence, like falling in love, like uh, contending with the travails of employment, and you know many others. If you got to build a house, whatever it was. So this is a, a particular time with a particular time signature that's attached to it. You best learn how to sing. Okay, so what I saw, though, didn't often go that way. What I saw was people clinging for dear life to that which was already effectively in the past tense. Mm. And it's a very sad apparition when you see fellow human beings who can't be persuaded to let go of what's already gone. It sounds counterintuitive to put it that way, but I think you... You have a feel for what I'm saying. Yeah. And so how does love come into this then? What, where does love end up? How does it end up? And so on. Well, generally what people did 
was cling to the loved one and therefore to love, whether they be the dying person or a family member or whatever it was. More specifically, they clung to the idea that the only thing that should not be allowed to change was love. Love was the great hallmark card constant. That's the one that people were gonna hold up like a banner and march beneath it. It's the true thing. It's the unchangeable thing. It's the eternal thing. And that's bullshit. It's none of those things. It can't be any of those things. Why not? Because your love does not in, exist independently of your loving. That's why. It's not some kind of cosmic gas that you get to watch play out across the sky every time you feel it. Jesus, Murphy, you're the agent of the thing. So if you're in disrepair and finally demise, what do you think becomes of your love actions, your love functions, your love capacities? Don't they wither in some corollary fashion to the same way that your fingernails are withering and your kidneys are withering and the rest? Sure they do. Is that wrong? Far from wrong. It's one of the most faithful renderings of what's happening. It's the way by which you can track where you are in the arc of your days, that you're willing to even have your understanding of love become a servant to what dying is asking of you. Because that's what it's doing. It's asking you to rejig your understanding of love to now include the endings that it's a witness to instead of being a defense against those endings, it becomes one of the ending things. And if you can love that too, you're finally loving like a grown up. Hmm. Now there's the gauntlet and I'm throwing it down and I'm saying it. And I'm not saying this because I'm a hard ass, you know, with no particular feelings. And so it's easy to say, I'm saying it because I saw the consequences of not doing it over and over and over again. And, and to be a witness to human beings doing that to themselves and to each other, and they can't be persuaded to change their mind, can break your heart and lead you into some fairly dark places. That's very possible. So all of this is to say then <coughs> that one of the fundamental acts of love as a grown-up is being willing, as you said in your question, to be a faithful witness to the time-limited aspect of what you are prepared to love and or whom and of your loving to. That as long as your loving is of this world, and it certainly is, then your loving will obey the natural order of things. And that's a kind of loving gesture too, that you don't try to lift your love above the fray, above the, the, uh, the slings and arrows that prevail, no? Okay, so now let's bring all of this malarkey to the present circumstances. And here we have to generalize a little bit, even though I chastised you for generalizing at the beginning, I'm gonna join you now a little bit just for the sake of trying to say something about it that could be useful to uh, whoever might be listening. Okay. So we have this circumstance where people, as we know, are dying in the most fundamental kind of aloneness that it's possible to imagine. They are uh, ensconced in a high tech hive. They're plugged, they're plumbed, they're traked, they're being, you know, not very gently massaged and all the rest. Mm -hmm. um, incommunicado, basically, either because they're being traked and can't talk or because nobody's allowed in or because uh, certainly in the, in the part of the world that I live in, uh, you have something like two people designated as the representatives of earth, of all of humanity and they're the ones that get to visit and nobody else does and there's no interchangeable 
aspect to that. It's those two people, come what may, who get to visit the person in their dying time. One at a time, I suppose, under heavy security and, and all the rest. So is there anything, quote, natural about the circumstance? Of course not. But wait a second. How natural was it before the pandemic? You see, this is one of the things that's happening is that people's memory of the pre-pandemic time has taken on a kind of rosy, golden glow. Freedom, unrestrained, you know, easy mixing with others. And if you just go down the list of how you think it was, you'll stop after about the third one, you'll say, well, actually it wasn't, it wasn't quite, at least I didn't live like that. No, you certainly didn't live like that. So you know your pre-pandemic life has now become an object of your fantasy, not your memory. Mm. What did we do with the time wherein we were unconstrained in our ability to visit people who are dying in the hospital? What did we do? Okay, so that's a good question to wonder about. And how did we die when there was no constraints of tricks and all the things I just articulated a minute ago? Mm. And when people could come and see you and, and how was it? Was it really the, the time of truth telling and absolute heart to heart encounter, the likes of which uh, a normal life can barely tolerate and bear? Was that what it was when we were able to do that? You know the answer to this and I know the answer to it too. And when I was in the death trade, I saw what people did with the freedom and the unconstrainedness and the lack of social isolation. So I'm gonna go out on a high wire and say, don't friggin' tell me that it's worse now than it was then. Okay, so that's a very feisty thing to say, I know. Yeah. And I'm not ignoring some of the on the ground realities of things that have changed. Sure. Like you having to sit in that room for interminable hours and all the rest. But you asked me about love. You didn't ask me about getting through, okay? So what is love then given all of this? I'm acting out of it in speaking to you about what I'm saying right now. In other words, the claim I'm making is love is love when it's not willing to blink, when it's willing to fess up and to confess and to recognize the gross self-imposed limitations that accompanied the typical Western person's typical life back in the day. See, mm. so here's the throwdown. You want to get back to normal? That should be the last thing you want. You want to be able to love like you used to be able to love? Are you sure? Or would you like to be able to love now in a way that never occurred to you before these troubles, before this pandemic, before this isolation and loneliness and sense of ongoing despair and dread and all the rest. If your love doesn't bear the fingerprints of what you've lived and haven't lived over the last year, it's probably not love. It's probably another form of cheerleading, an idea that you can catch a break by forming some kind of virtual relationship with another human being that as soon as they ring the all clear signal, you'll run into each other's arms and live as if you've never lived before. See, it's heavy stuff, no? Yeah. But you're asking me, okay? So this is the guy, uh, this is all I got, is what I saw and my attempt to translate it, mm -hmm. right? And then, frankly, hold myself and everybody who's willing to think about it to a different standard than just getting by. Because surely, I mean, <laughs> obviously I'm on a rant now, but I'll finish this part with this thing. Maybe you woke up this morning doing what I'm about to describe. Maybe not. Your eyes open involuntarily. You don't really open your eyes. They just kind of open. And depending on what you did the night before, things come into view and into focus and so on. <coughs> and generally speaking, stuff's where you left it when you closed your eyes. 
including you. There you are, your eyes having opened again, and for no apparent reason, with no apparent uh, reward coming to you directly or acknowledgement of anything that you did in particular, you are alive. And within 10 seconds, you can quickly do the math and realize that fellow human beings in the same city that you live in are not. Either because of the pandemic or the other reasons that people die. But they did die and you didn't. And so here's the question. It's not exactly why not, it's what for. You're alive. Are you proceeding accordingly? Are you informed by the understanding that this aliveness that's entrusted to you is a time limited thing, just the same way that being able to perform in Salt Lake City on a given night is a time limited thing. What do you do with the limit? Do you complain about it? Do you bitch about it? Do you kick at it with your feet? Or do you live as if it's one of the things that's granted to you. You get to do it, and then you get to have to stop doing it. How does love figure into that? And the answer I think is obvious, that you perform as if you're not going to be performing sometime, and you'll never see these people again, and this night will never be replicated. And how do you do that night after night after night? Well, that's what being a performer is. It's not a fakery but it's a willingness to have this thing reborn and reborn and reborn again night until the tour is over. And here's the PS, the tour is over and you either with either sorrow or with relief bid farewell to your fellow band members in the airport. And all of a sudden you're on your own and some flight to somewhere that connects to somewhere that connects to getting picked up and finally been driven home and you parachute back into a place completely uninformed by the parade of humanity that you were lucky enough to be part of and to see. And how are you gonna translate all of your gratitude and everything you saw into living a normal, unspectacular, non-performing life, which is where your ability to perform secretly comes from. And there's the assignment, and that's what love looks like this morning to me.